ahead and start the recording. Welcome everybody to Mindful Social on Blab this week. And we are all about bringing mindfulness into your lives and into how you use social media in particular. My guest this week is Susan Kaiser Greenland. And I was really intrigued by some of the things that she's been putting out there. And so I wanted to introduce you to her and also to innerkids.com, which is a project that she's working on. Susan, why don't you give us a little bit of information about you? Um, well, I joke that I'm a recovering lawyer. I was a corporate lawyer for a good long time. And uh, at that time, I was also a young mom. My kids are now 22 and 25. They're, they're all grown up, but uh, they weren't when I had a very, very stressful job that I loved. It wasn't a stressful job I hated. I'm one of those people who really loved practicing law, uh, but I had some trouble managing the stress. And um, a couple of different things happened in my life that made me think and that meditation would be a good thing for me to help me manage some ups and downs in my life. And so I started practicing meditation pretty early on um, and studying it with teachers who were trained in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, then when I had my own kids, that was at a time mindfulness in kids just really wasn't a thing. Even John Ken Wyla Kabat Zinn, who wrote this fantastic groundbreaking book on mindful parenting called Everyday Blessings, which is mm. still a wonderful book that I would encourage everyone to go out and buy. Uh, that book hadn't yet been published yet. And uh, my family was not Buddhist, even though I was a study, I was studying Buddhism. So going to a Buddhist uh, retreat or a family retreat just didn't make sense for my kids and my husband. So I thought, OK, I'm going to start just using some of the things that I'm learning as an adult. At that point, primarily attention training practices and see if it helps my kids. And I started to see a change. And then I started adding other practices that didn't only develop attention. But then as we went further into the practices and the games, they developed balance and compassion. And um, one thing led to another. Some friends heard what I was doing and asked if I would volunteer in their school, which I did while maintaining my law practice. And I volunteered at the Boys and Girls Club, again, while maintaining my law practice. And uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up segueing out of the law practice, writing a couple of books. I've got a new one coming out now called Mindful Games. Okay. And um, I have one that has been out for a while called The Mindful Child. And uh, that's what I do. And Inner Kids is a program that was developed based on these mindful games. And there was a foundation uh, in the uh, early 2000s, like 2000 to 2009, 2010, that brought mindfulness into schools. And there were a number of wonderful teachers that worked with me on that. So mm -hmm. that's kind of my story. So what does mindfulness bring to children? How does it, how does it help them? You know, it's a it's an interesting thing because mindfulness has become very popular now. And so the word mindfulness has been conflated. It means all sorts of things to all sorts of people. So even before asking that question, which is a really maybe the most important question to ask anyone that you're talking to about mindfulness, it's important to define our terms. So remember, even among classical Buddhist traditions, they're not in 100% agreement about what all of these different terms mean. And believe me, there's a lot of them. It, uh, Buddhism is jokingly called the, you know, the philosophy of, of 100 lists. There's just list after list after list. And not every tradition is in complete agreement. And remember, I was uh, raised in this tradition uh, more from the Tibetan perspective. So with that in mind, uh, and also adding the other layer that I'm a secular, I work with secular mindfulness with kids and families. So my goal is really to take these classical practices and make them very accessible kids with and families without dumbing them down. So you can see I'm a lawyer because look at all those caveats I put in first. So with all of those different qualifications, uh, for me and for the way I teach, mindfulness is really about being aware of your state of mind and where your attention is at the same time. So really stopping to notice or to become familiar 
with the patterns of your mind and body as far as where you direct your attention and what's your state of mind. And that's a little bit different from meditation because remember often mindfulness and meditation are put together and thought to be the same thing. And they actually aren't, at least in the way that I have been practiced. They, there is mindfulness meditation, but the two terms aren't exactly the same. And for mindfulness meditation or for meditation, uh, those for me and the way I work with kids and with families is that those are introspective practices where we become familiar again with our minds and our bodies. We become familiar with our patterns of thought and emotion, our patterns of action and reaction. And the word mm -hmm. familiarization is an interesting one because in Tibetan, uh, the word for meditation can also be trans trans uh, translated into to become familiar. So to shorten that uh, that uh, question down to something that could possibly be shared on social media and might possibly even in a tweet, um, I really think of mindfulness in a definition that I have been. Um, heard from a guy named Cortland Dahl out of Tergar uh, in, in Minneapolis. Mindfulness is knowing where your mind is and knowing your state of mind. So mm -hmm. mindfulness is knowing where your mind is and knowing your state of mind. That's really, really important when you think about social media, because not only do we need to know where our attention is, but before we hit that button on the email, before we hit send or before we hit post, if we do a quick check to see what's our state of mind. Are we, are we angry? Are we annoyed? Are we happy? Are we feeling pretty settled? But we want to make sure that we know our state of mind before hitting that post, because if we don't, that's sometimes when we can get in trouble and our kids can get into trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's really about knowing what your state of mind is, but also having, you know, if, if you're using social media for business, what are your intentions? Yes. What is it that you intend to communicate? And, you know, we tend to be very knee jerk with how we use social media and just pop things off. But, you know, you're not really thinking about the big picture or the impact that it's going to have on the people that read that tweet yeah. in particular. Um, yeah. I like to think that the tweets help us to focus our messaging a little bit because they have to be shorter. And yeah, I think you know, you're so right. that helps. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you're right. I think 100, I, I'm sorry. I think I read that Twitter is going above 140 characters. And I'm really sorry to hear that because I do believe that all of us need to do exactly what you said. We need to hone our message. What is it we're trying to say? Who is it we're trying to reach on social media? Why are we doing this in the first place? And then when that's all kind of sorted, which is more of a big picture stuff, in the moment, where's our attention right now? Are we focused on what we're doing? Because if we're distracted, that's a good way to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's happening in our mind and body right now from an emotional place? Are we, do we have speedy energy? Are we a little charged up? Are we really focused and calm and content? Are we annoyed? And those things when we got speedy energy or when we're a little bit annoyed, sometimes it's time to wait and pause before posting that tweet or posting that yes. Facebook post. Just take a breath. Yeah. Before you click send on anything, an email, a Facebook yeah. post, a tweet, just take that breath and, and think about it. That that helps a lot. Um, so I want to go back to the, the topic of kids because, you know, I have a 16 year old son and, and we've been talking more recently in the last year or so about, you know, where he is and what he's feeling, which of course is kind of tumultuous at this age. But at what age can you deal with children and help them to understand how they're feeling and where their focus is? Um, it seems yeah, that there's, when, it's more of a challenge with a younger child. When they're born. Hmm. And I'm not sure, I mean, that's not a glib answer, when they're born, because remember, Early on in those very early years, especially the first 18 months, there's an awful lot of parent-child regulation and co-regulating going on. Mm -hmm. So while we are not explaining mindfulness to a newborn uh, or any of the concepts to a newborn or a toddler, um, what we are doing is we're learning that if we can regulate ourselves, if we can um, 
downregulate ourselves, if we can notice where our mind is, if we can stay in the moment and in a mindful relationship with our child, that's amazing modeling is very important modeling. And it also builds a closer attached, attuned, healthily attuned relationship with our kids. So mm -hmm. early on when we're parents, the important thing, well, frankly, throughout the lifespan, the important thing is that parents develop their own practice. Then around four, we can start working with kids uh, away from their parents on their own with simple practices that, um, help them really focus on what's happening in the moment right now. Remembering mm -hmm. that cognitively, developmentally, they're not yet ready. They just don't yet have the brain development to know where their mind is and know where their state of mind is, what their state right. of mind is. That happens more in the fourth, fifth grade range, sometimes a little younger, sometimes a little older. But early on, we really do something that may not be um, technically mindfulness, but it's very much like mindfulness, which is being in the moment with the child engaged in the activity and really being present and mm -hmm. trying to um, just have that kind of present moment, wonderful experience without a lot of overlay of layer of thinking or analyzing it. So then that could be, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. That could be something as simple as sitting on the floor with your child while they're drawing a picture instead mm -hmm. of getting on your iPhone. Yep. And just being there while they're drawing a picture rather than taking the crayon and trying to finish it for them <laughs> <laughs> or, um, mm -hmm. or suggesting, Oh, maybe you want that to be blue rather than green. Um, I will never forget when my son, who is a very creative kid and is a very creative young man to this day, when we got the phone call from the school that the art teacher had told us he was using too much green um, in his pictures. Uh, she didn't know who she was calling because it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't really, it wasn't, I wasn't the right person to have tried to have, uh, make that case with hmm. but uh, yeah just being there and letting them color for the sake of coloring and enjoy it and us just being there and appreciating the experience and not having an overlay of expectations of what it was going to be or what it was going to lead mm -hmm. to not being restrictive yeah in particular yeah. i think yeah. yeah yeah okay so we understand that you know the the mental development of a child and the ability to grasp some of these concepts may be a little limited maybe till what fifth or sixth grade yeah so well, fourth, you know it, it's all i hate to put in it's um, developmental yeah it's developmental and some kids you know things come at different times for sure. them but somewhere in that neighborhood okay so let's move up to say six your seventh 16 grade. year old i'm sorry are we up to your 16 year old yet uh, okay <laughs> but let's let's move up to sixth seventh grade what kind of things can we do to help a child understand where they're at right now? Well, um, at that point, the question really isn't as much what they're developmentally ready to do, although they're still developing. At that point, that kind of preteen age, we're really talking about buy-in, mm. right? I don't know about you, but middle school and every child I have ever met, including, including my childhood and my husband's childhood, middle school is a tough time. So it tends to be a very tumultuous time, a lot of ups and downs. And unless if we can help them understand that mindfulness is actually useful and relates to what's going on in their life, uh, it's hard to get them to buy in. So the real trick with uh, mindfulness at that age is to help them with buy-in, to make it fun, to practice for short periods of time frequently, mm. drop bits of mindfulness in throughout the day, which actually I do with everybody, regardless of age, parents, professionals, uh, executives, the same thing. Mm. And uh, and really find ways that that mindfulness is relationship, relational if possible, so that they're in conversation with other people and that they relate it to their own life. So if you can have kids practicing mindfulness together or kids talking about mindfulness together. When other children tell them that mindfulness is useful for them, that helps with buy-in in, in a way that we can't do. There's a program out of the UK called Dot B, which I love. It's a, I think it's called the Mindfulness in Schools Project. Um, 
and they're a wonderful program, a couple of great guys, and they created this uh, idea. It's not an app, it's not a, anything other than an idea, but in their program, they teach children to, uh, or teenagers and preteens, to text each other dot B, which means huh. breathe. And they mm. do that at times where there's no emotional charge. It's just like a homework assignment, text somebody dot B throughout the day. Now, I, I know this from mm. having talked to these guys years ago. I hope it's still in their program. I was so impressed with it, but there may be people on the call who know more about this program as it is now than I do. And so please feel free to, to let us know. But the great thing about texting dot B at times when uh, there's not an emotional charge is that kids just get used to hearing stop, breathe throughout the day without a big agenda. Mm -hmm. And then what is beautiful is these anecdotal stories coming from um, their teenagers and their preteens that when a kid is in trouble, when a teenager is in trouble and is texting their friends, there have been times that those teenagers have texted dot B right back at them mm. in the time that was emotionally charged. So it helps them integrate this into their problem solving strategies. So that's what I would say about that age group is it's not as much, you're always working developmentally to try to have words that are easy to understand, to make it fun. But the real question there is buy-in and helping kids see how it's actually useful in their real life. Mm. I love what you said about sending it when it isn't a time that's emotionally charged, because I really think that's hugely important because if you try to tell somebody in a crisis to just breathe, yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous unless they already understand what that means. Yeah. And so having, even if it's just, uh, you know, a random event, yeah. um, you can do that. Although I have to say that I, I'm very geeky, so I download a lot of apps to try them out. Uh -huh. And I downloaded the Relax app, uh -huh. which is really interesting because it prompts you throughout the day, hey, just need a break, uh -huh. take a break. Yeah. And every time it does, I get aggravated because it comes at the wrong moment. Yes. And rather than just going, okay, taking that second and breathing, I'm like, oh, what bad timing, that, bad timing, right? move on. What a gift that is, because you know that's just a pattern that's running in you. Otherwise, my husband has the same thing. My husband just recently, he's a very fit guy, but he just recently was at a nutritionist who asked him to buy a Fitbit, which has that buzzing mm -hmm. function. And he's a writer, so he's at his desk for many, many hours. And the buzzing function buzzes once an hour, right? <laughs> Every time that watch buzzes, he gets furious. He gets so mad at that watch. And I said, what a gift this is for you. Look at how mad you're getting at a watch, you know, mm. for something that you actually programmed. I mean, it really, remember mindfulness <laughs> meditation, the, that definition of meditation as familiarization with your mind. Mm -hmm. We become familiar with these kind of patterns. And if it's like getting mad at your watch because it's buzzing you to get up and take 250 steps, all you can do is laugh at it. And then once you're aware of that pattern, you start seeing it in other places where, yes. oh, wow, this may be getting in my way somehow. This may be mm -hmm. getting in my way. So I think all those things are just <laughs> such gifts. Gifts. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right, of course, because, you know, when you can see that you have an emotional reaction to something, that is a gift to be able yeah. to stop and notice it and say, oh, OK, I'm angry and, you know, really yeah. accept that and decide, you know, if you're going to do anything about it or you're not going to do anything about it isn't really relevant as much as it is that you notice that that thing that you're doing. Yeah, that's why I so encourage people once they are interested in mindfulness and meditation to go on silent meditation retreats with a whole mm. bunch of strangers because you find yourself, you're in silence, you don't know these people, and you find yourself in the lunch line reading things into slight gla glances or uh, body language that you know couldn't possibly be what's actually going on. So you're able to see these patterns of mind that are that are functioning and are running all day long, every day, in more layered situations. But you see the real stark 
consciousness that we have certain patterns of mind that just plain run. And then of course, that's where self-compassion is so important and kindness mm -hmm. to self and a sense of humor about it all. You know, not beating ourselves up about the fact that we have these patterns or that we're mad at our Fitbit, but just noticing, okay, well, everybody's got some of this stuff and uh, it happens to everybody. And just thinking that, taking it a lot more easy on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, making everything so serious. And, you know, as you said, having so many layers of things going on that you can't see anything. Yeah. So, you know, in a, a silent retreat, then that does give you the opportunity to observe a lot and you realize how much you really got going on. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, how can we as parents uh, start working with children or better yet working with a daycare or working with a school uh -huh. to try to bring, excuse me, try to bring some element of mindfulness into the classroom? Well, the first thing, and I, I know I might be beginning to sound like a, a broken record, but the first thing is to start your own practice, mm -hmm. develop your own practice so that you have a felt sense so that you have experience of what this is. Um, the next thing I personally would do would be to really find, I mean, I'm saying this especially because of the content of this podcast, which is on social media, really find the legit providers of authentic mindfulness and meditation mm -hmm. on the internet, on the, on, on, uh, websites, Twitter, social media, many, many, many wonderful organizations are now tweeting and uh, linking to articles. And many people are trying to take complicated ideas and put them into simple language. Because one of the problems we have now is that so much of the information out there is, um, is now caught up in this kind of materialist culture we've got of making money and go-go and quick fixes. And the one thing we know is that mindfulness can have very immediate, helpful, wonderful impacts, but it is not a quick fix and that it is not always easy. Mm -hmm. So if I were a parent, um, a young parent now, and what I advise the parents I'm working with is to read a couple books. You don't have to read a million books, read a couple books um, that are by really credentialed people. Find one or two of them that resonates with you because if we read too much, we can get confused at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Find ways to practice consistent with those people. And there's all sorts of stuff online that most places now do offer. And build your own practice. Once you have a sense of practice, you don't need to practice three years. You don't need to practice five years before sharing this with your children. But what you do need to do is find what it is that resonates with you. And that can be different. For some people, remember, there's all kinds of practices. It's not just self-regulation practices. And for some people, the appreciation practices, which is a wonderful place to start for everybody, especially for children, and also, frankly, for teenagers, the appreciation practices are good places to begin if you don't have a long time of sitting on the cushion. But it's important to remember with those appreciation practices, we're not pushing the, oh, everything's good, or push your feelings under the carpet. We're pushing the idea that we can hold complex thoughts in our mind at once, that it is possible to have something really rotten happening in our life right now, and at the same time have something good. Mm -hmm. So we don't deny the rotten things that are happening if they are happening. We don't ask kids to pretend they're not happening. We don't ask them not to deal with them. But we also widen our perspective to include that there's also positive things happening too. So I'd find what it is that resonates with you. Maybe it's simple breath awareness practices. Maybe it's sensory practices. Maybe it's movement, which is also really important for young children, mm -hmm. especially if for anybody, adult or child, who has a lot of energy. Uh, sitting still is not necessarily the best thing. Find a couple things that work for you and then share them with your child in plain, simple language. Just short periods throughout the day. And that's how I'd start. And if you want to bring it into your school and you're a parent, try it home first. Um, 
The other thing I would say that's really interesting, the mindfulness in school movement, which I have been part of since the very beginning, Inner Kids was bringing um, mindfulness into schools in 2000, which may have been the first uh, program that was actually doing that in a systematic way. There is a huge rush to bring mindfulness into the schools. There's a huge need to bring mindfulness into the schools. But if you're new to mindfulness, I would really encourage you not to start there. Mindfulness in the schools is a little bit like the college or the graduate school or the doctoral program. You've got to really know your stuff if you're going to bring mindfulness into a classroom situation. But there are so many places that you can learn your, learn your craft in Girl Scout troops, in Boy Scout troops, in churches, in synagogues, in community centers, in places in your chill in your backyard by having a group of friends over and their kids. So I would really encourage people to start in places like that that are smaller and build up their um, experience and then start uh, working in the schools. Unless if you're going to the school to advocate for an established program as an advocate. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, we can't uh, we can't teach something we don't know, mm -hmm. and that we we don't understand, and we certainly don't want to go off half cocked with, you know, ideas that that aren't going to be helpful. Uh -huh. I think that maybe an extension of that then is to start with mindfulness training for the instructors and for the administration of the school so that they can start to practice it themselves and then bring it into the classroom. Well, that's because the goal. end. It isn't going to be the yeah. parent. That is the gold standard. That's the mm -hmm. bring it in. That's where what I've been focusing on in my work with school, we had originally brought it in ourselves and then it became very clear to change the system. You really need to change the whole system, which includes not just the, um, the administration and the teachers and the educators, but also the parent body. So any wonderful, uh, fully rounded program bringing mindfulness into a school system, I think really it's helpful to include uh, some kind of a regular uh, get together, for lack of a better word, for parents who are interested mm -hmm. too. And even if you just have, I've got so many people that I work with who have four parents, seven parents coming to these regular uh, groups to sit and meditate after drop off or after school or at lunchtime. Those oh, four or seven parents get very, very motivated to bring about change because they start to know from the inside out how it's helping them and the nuances and all that can change if you can just take the time and practice mindfulness and meditation in a systematic and respectful way. So mm. I think some parent group is also really important and really key. And I have so many parents who are really enthusiastic and new meditators who will then go out and hire a meditation facilitator to come in and run a parent group in their child's school. And that's terrific. And then you really get the ball rolling. Yeah, because then you're really doing it from the bottom up with the kids, from the parents to the kids, and then the kids bring it to school. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, which which makes them so much better citizens. It does. <laughs> Community members. It does, because they're yeah. able to hold other people. It's not just that they're able to self-regulate, which they can. It, they can self They can down-regulate better with similar practice, and the early research that's coming out is showing that. But also, if you include the social emotional components uh, of mindfulness and other really high end social emotional programs that are out there already that have begun integrating mindfulness into them, um, you teach children to hold other people in mind. And in the world in which we're living right now, in the political climate we're living right now, and not to get too political, I mean, you know, with our, with our presidential campaign, we're not really modeling for our children. Yeah. the importance of holding somebody else in mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that I, doesn't mean forgetting about agree. yourself. It doesn't mean putting their needs before the ch our needs or putting other kids, putting uh, other kids' needs before theirs. But 
it's again that more complicated, complex, dualistic capacity or non less dualistic capacity of holding more than one thought in mind at the same time. It is possible to hold somebody else in mind and hold our own needs mind and hold the planet's mind, it, it, the planet's needs in mind, and then make a um, make a decision on what we're going to do. And that's something I think that's achieved by practice mm -hmm. that you're not immediately going to be a whole, able to hold all that in your head necessarily. But as you practice more and more, and you know, obviously, especially true for children, that the more you practice, the more you're able to do that, the more you're able to kind of comprehend all at once yeah. and, and bring into your mind. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's and again, amazing. just the reminder that that, again, is a developmental skill. So young children mm -hmm. just haven't yet developed in to the point that they're able to do all of this. But as kids get older, they're able to and, and young children are able to do some. I um, I I believe it was Pema Chodron, but I may be wrong. Uh, I believe it was her, though, in her book, When Things Fall Apart. She has a line in there that has stayed with me forever, which is, People are always asking us when you know your practice is working. How do you know your practice is working? How can you tell? And uh, and I think it was her who said, you know, when you're thinking more of other people, when you when mm. your mind is thinking more of other people and less of yourself. And that again doesn't mean you're putting yourself down or putting your needs uh, behind the needs of other people. It means that constant analysis of what am I doing? Am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? Did I do this? Did I do that? That slows down. Yeah, yeah. Well, and when you mention people that you can easily learn from, she's one of the ones that really resonates with me. I think her uh, places that scare you is is another one that was a really great book from her. Yeah. Um, I wanted to mention too that uh, you two should definitely know each other. Uh, last week we had the peaceful professor, Jessica Smith on the show and she's working more in the college area mm -hmm. and expanding mindfulness there. And it was a really interesting discussion. And, and I think that there is a possibility now for college kids who, you know, traditionally weren't really that mindful, but things have been changing and, and evolving. And I think now that that age group is really wanting to embrace mindfulness and really kind of wanting to slow the world down a little. And I think that's something that yeah. you can definitely use mindfulness practice to help you with. Yeah, there's a group, um, the contemplative, um, I believe it's contemplative mind uh, really works in higher education. And I don't think there's, it's, I think it's extremely important in higher education right now. If you think of all that's going on with respect to trigger warnings and with respect to uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, all sorts of other things that are making that world a little bit more complicated to navigate and a little bit more complicated to have points of view that are not considered uh, politically correct right now. Um, the idea of building in mindfulness programs that teach critical thinking and, mm -hmm. and these are mindfulness and meditation programs. Remember mindfulness, one of the things that's tricky about the word mindfulness is we're now using mindfulness kind of as a catch-all for a lot of things. So these are programs for mindfulness and meditation, programs teaching attention, balance, and compassion that really teach critical thinking and that really teach kids a less dualistic way of looking at the world, a more holistic way of looking at the world. Mm. They're not necessarily black and white. Just because their opinion isn't the same as yours doesn't mean it's right or wrong. And possibly the biggest thing that we can teach kids is to just be able to observe and be with the experience for a while without jumping to a conclusion or jumping to judgment because it allows us to see things more clearly and also to see more deeply the whole field, the whole web of causes and conditions that are leading up to this very moment. Mm. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting as you watch children evolve and you understand how they can absorb more information or less information and how they kind of go through stages where everything is black and white. Yeah. 
And then they start to evolve a little bit more and they start to realize that, you know, there are shades of gray and that there are other things going on. And I've been realizing that more with my son, you know, as he evolves his thinking, as I clearly remember the days, it was black or white and there was nothing else. And he's really uh, developed quite a lot since then. And it's really interesting to see him open his mind to other possibilities, even ones that he doesn't necessarily agree with, but he'll still listen to them. Yeah. And that's something that we can all benefit from. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And it means you're doing something right because that's a, that's a point where kids can start to contract and just go more in the black and white because it feels safer mm -hmm. or go in the other direction and really open themselves up to be open to all sorts of different possibilities and then have discernment to be able to figure out what is the right thing to do in this moment, mm -hmm. knowing that I can never know absolutely every cause and condition that's leading up to this moment. I can never know exactly everything that happened from the other person's perspective, but I can, I can do my best to figure out as much as I can and then make a decision depending on what I know. And trust that they can make that decision. And if it's wrong, it's okay. Yes. Yeah. That's that's an important one too. Yeah. Well, I, I could talk to you for a very long time, but we did promise 30 minutes. So I would like you to uh, let people know where they can get your book and where they can find out about your next book when it's released. Oh, thank you. Well, I am in the middle of revising my website to make it more mobile friendly um, mm -hmm. and more up to date. But you can still find me online at that website, which is Susan Kaiser Greenland. I know it's long. Susan Kaiser greenland.com i am on twitter at susan k greenland um i'm on facebook i'm on uh, instagram uh, but you can find all of that by going to the website susan kaiser greenland.com and then the book the mindful child is available is easily available on amazon just go to my website and you can click through right to amazon or to any one of a number of independent booksellers uh, and then the Mindful Games book, which is coming out in November, in which uh, I had the tremendous help of a friend and other mindfulness teacher, Annika Harris. She helped me edit the games on that book. That's coming out in November. And it's going to be followed by a set of cards that are like about this big that have the games and the directions on them, plus tips, plus the life school skills that we're trying to develop with each other. Wow, them. that sounds fun. Which, yeah, we think those will be really helpful for parents to just put in their bag and take to the bleachers if they're sitting on the bleachers watching a softball game with one child and they've got another child on the bleachers or wherever. So... Um, and also for professionals to just have those with them rather than having to page through a book. So those are the things. Just check out my website, SusanKaiserGreenland.com. You can get me on Twitter and Facebook and, uh, and Instagram from there. And then the books you can get on Amazon or independent bookstores, uh, hopefully everywhere. Great. And you can also find links to the books and to Susan's website on our website, mindfulsocialmarketing.com. And we will have this replay on YouTube and also on Spreaker. I wanna thank you so much, Susan. This has been really great. Thank you, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you.